Okay, so now we've talked about conformity, where nobody specifically asked us to go along, but we oftentimes go along with the social norms or we trust the group for information. We've talked about obedience, where uh, an authority figure a um, requests, demands that we do something, and you know what's the probability we'll go along with them. Now let's just talk about the ways that our behavior changes in the presence of other people. Um, there are different ways. There's social facilitation, which refers to those times when our behavior actually improves when we're around other people. Um, you know, this is what accounts for the home field advantage that we see in certain sports teams, where they um, hardly ever lose when they're in front of their home crowd. Certain kinds of sports really benefit from the energy that you get from the crowd, and you can really see uh, a home field advantage. Those are usually sports that have a lot of overlearned behaviors involved in them, like running or dribbling or things like that. Um, behavior, uh, sports that require um, responding to variable things like um, baseball, you know, you have lots of bounces and hops and things that can go wrong, um, are less benefited from social facilitation because it doesn't matter how much energy is coming from the crowd, if the ball takes a bad bounce, the ball took a bad bounce, right? So facilitation really um, really pertains to those behaviors that you've got really overlearned, that you really know well, and that maybe you've actually gotten a little stale in your performance of those behaviors when you're doing it on your own in practice. And then that extra oomph that you get from the crowd, you can play your piano piece with more emotion. Um, you know, you can do that dance routine with more flexibility and um, power and stuff like that when the crowd is watching you. Whereas when you were at practice, you're like, eh, getting tired of it. Key thing is, it's got to be overlearned. You've got to have practiced it to the point where you can do it really without thinking if you're going to get that social facilitation. Um, so it works best for overlearned tasks, things that you've learned and then learned it some more until it's become automatic. Social loafing is sort of the opposite of social facilitation. Social facilitation, you perform better when you're around other people. In social loafing, you display decreased effort when you're in a group. They actually did an experiment involving a tug of war, and they blindfolded people, and the uh, participants didn't know how many other people were helping them pull. And what they found is when they were blindfolded, they pulled at the same basic rate. When they had their blindfold taken off and they could see how many other people were with them, the more people that were pulling, the less the individual pulled. So, you know, it's kind of like working in a group in a class, right, where um, if you're all going to get the same grade for the output, a lot of times you end up with a social loafer who's like, you know what, my, my efforts my contribution is not going to be missed. So why strain myself? I have other homework and stuff I could be doing instead, so I'm just going to ride these people's coattails. Um, it's one of the things that makes it really hard for me to figure out how to do group work in classes because I really don't want you know, the loafers to get the same grade as people who it legitimately did the work. Um, and it's a tough one to figure that out. But we do it in lots of different kinds of groups and lots of different kinds of settings. We realize we don't, it doesn't really matter if I pitch in or not. I sometimes do it when we're carrying something heavy, and so they've recruited a lot of people to help carry it because it's something heavy, and then I realize, oh, you guys don't actually need me, so I'll be like pretending like it's heavy <laughs> like, ah, as I'm carrying it. Um, that's my favorite social loafing situation. De-individuation. Uh, let's just enjoy all the morphemes that have been stuck onto that one word. de individu Right, so we're going to take away your feeling of individuality. Um, generally, what we're talking about with deindividuation is negative behaviors, where you have a loss of self-awareness and loss of self-restraint. So I've got a picture of a um, riot going on here. Um, rioting behavior was what we what researchers were first looking at and considering when we're, when they're talking about deindividuation. That you know you feel like who's going to know it was me? So you could break a window or you could do some looting or you know hurl a bottle at the police and nobody's going to know it was you. And the act of being in the group sort of stirs you up and makes you more emotional than you would have been otherwise. So you do stuff you wouldn't have done otherwise. Now I'd like to point out there are cases of deindividuation that are beneficial also. One of the things that we noticed early on when online learning became av available was that uh, through discussion boards, um, classmates were talking to each other and sharing ideas 
in ways that they don't in a regular class, it's a lot harder to get people to talk and participate and share their thoughts face to face than it is in the anonymity of online. And so um, classes seemed like they were more dynamic. Uh, I noticed that when I used to do discussion boards, students would oftentimes exchange regular emails after the class was over so they could stay in communication. Part of why I've gotten away from discussion boards is that since Canvas introduced having pictures next to each other, for one thing, you're not as anonymous. The other thing I don't like is the way that Canvas threads the discussion. They're really hard to follow. And so it, uh, that's part of why I've gone away from discussions. I used to really love discussions, but in this platform, I'm not, I don't like them. And so that's why you don't have discussions. So in case you were wondering, and plus I've gotten a lot of feedback from students that, you know, they may not enjoy discussions that much. And so I've kind of gotten away from it and tried to give you guys more concrete tasks to do. But had we stuck with Blackboard, or Angel, I probably would have st stuck with discussions. I'm just saying. So thanks, Canvas, for good or for bad. Um, here's an example of de-individuation also. You know, a person who puts on a costume and covers up their face, um, that's a form of de-individuation. And um, so it's one of those things where you can um, feel anonymous and do stuff you wouldn't otherwise do. It gives people confidence. Um, so usually when we're talking about de-individuation, we're talking about aroused groups. Now aroused, and I'm showing you uh, somebody in a costume, I'm not talking about, you know, any kind of sexual arousal. I'm talking about like arousal of, you know, like what we talked about with stress, right? We're all wound up about something and then you're feeling anonymous. So a person in a costume doesn't need as many people around them to feel anonymous as a person who has their face uncovered. Um, they found that uh, in, among um, what are they called? Armies. Sorry, I was blanking on the term, which is ironic because as I'm lecturing today, it's Veterans Day and I forgot the word army. So, yeah, don't infer anything. I don't know what, I was just having a mind blank. Um, so, armies that invoke face painting or covering their face with um, shields and things like that tend to do more barbaric things to their um, the, the conquered people than um, armies that keep their faces uncovered. Um, it's part of that de-individuation. You're all wound up and your face is covered, you're anonymous, and it's also part of why we put our armies in uniforms so that everybody's the same and it's hard to figure out who individually did anything um, and it leads to de-individuation. Now here's a positive example. You know, if you're in a big group, you're probably more likely to sing even if you know that your voice isn't that great than if you were asked to sing alone. Right? Um, so sometimes under the cover of anonymity in a group, you'll do stuff that you might be too embarrassed to do otherwise. So, I mean, it can be good, it can be bad, right? Group polarization. We see this in groups where they've had a discussion about two perspectives. And what happens after the discussion is that the opposing groups actually become more solid in their pre-existing opinions than they were before this meeting of the minds supposed discussion went on. We see this after debates and stuff. You know, the two sides will have their debate. Whoever you already liked seems to have won the debate in your mind. It's not like your eyes are open to alternative perspectives while you're watching a debate. Instead, you just become firmer in what you already believed. Here's an example of a research study where um, they measured the attitude that people had um, before the discussion. And you can see the red bar is up at a plus three and the blue bar is at an almost negative two before the discussion. And then what you find is after the discussion has occurred, the red bar is slightly higher. It's a little bit above the three. And the blue bar is significantly lower after the discussion. So it's like, the groups moved farther away in their opinions after discussing and supposedly sharing ideas than they were to start off with. Um, and that's called group polarization. We're, we think we're coming together, but in fact, we're just digging a deeper trench. Here's an example of liberal blogs in the blue and conservative blogs in the red. The yellow is anytime there's overlap. And so what you find is not a lot of overlap. People pretty much want to be polarized. They want to seek out other people's opinions that are like theirs. Um, so yeah, w group polarization is all around us. Group think. Okay, this c term was coined to explain what happened in the Kennedy cabinet surrounding the decision to support the invaders of the Bay of Pigs of Cuba. Um, 
it, this happened very early in the Kennedy presidency, some rebels came and asked for financial support, some weapons, they wanted some air support from some B-52 bombers that were stationed in like uh, Colombia or something at the time. And these rebels were going to try and overthrow Castro. And Kennedy wanted to overthrow Castro pretty hard. So he, he liked the idea. And so he took it to his cabinet. And this was, like I said, early in his presidency. So this was a cabinet who hadn't met together that often. And Kennedy came in and said, you know, I'm thinking we should do this. Let's discuss and decide whether we should do this or not. Well, he committed one of the biggest sins of groupthink, which is um, he came in and he, he shared his opinion. The charismatic leader came in and shared his opinion. And that led the group to make a decision without fully discussing the pros, the cons, the ups, the downs, the things that could go right and wrong. Um, nobody wants to say anything against what they think is the group's decision because they're trying to maintain social harmony. So here we are, a new cabinet um, with our charismatic young president who's come in and told us that he thinks it's a good idea and then asked our opinion. We all look around at each other, nobody's saying anything against him, and so social conformity demands that we just go along with the group. Even though in their heads, way after this was all over, in their heads the, ca the cabinet members report that they were thinking, oh my gosh, I don't think we should do this, I can think of all sorts of things that can go wrong, but no one said anything because they didn't want to be the one person who rocked the boat. Here's a cartoon that illustrates it. So we've got the CEO or whatever saying all those in favor say I everybody says I but in their heads they're thinking no I don't want to this is horrible but no one wants to be the first one to raise a dissenting opinion this just happened to me two weeks ago in a meeting um, somebody said something the leader said something and I raised my opinion on it first which was dissenting with hers I said I don't know I don't think that's a good idea and what's interesting is that the next person who spoke was somebody who agreed with the leader and who had been a former leader in the group and she said well I'd like to beg to differ and everybody piled on with the agreement with the current leader and the former leader and we're all conforming until all of a sudden it became clear that we, they all decided we're going to go with what we just decided, ignore the one person who st stood up. And I got to tell you, I felt uncomfortable standing up. Um, they, were all, they all went together. And then as they started talking about how to implement the thing they'd all agreed to, somebody else revealed that this actually wasn't going to work for them and that you know, my comment had actually been right on point. And then all of a sudden people started coming out. But it wasn't until it was implementation time that it started coming out what you know what the real problem with the issue was. It wasn't just me trying to be, they thought I was just trying to be argumentative. And I wasn't trying to be argumentative. I was seeing the other side. And, uh, and, and, it, and you know what, the other side didn't actually impact me. I just could foresee that I thought this might impact people and you guys aren't thinking about it like that. And uh, it's funny how everybody wanted to go along with the, le with the leaders of the group and didn't want to be the descending people, dissenting people. And then ultimately they realized they had to dissent. It wasn't going to work. And actually it was the leader realizing that first and then everybody else went along. So I think I'm still cast as the, the uh, controversial, you know, naysayer. <laughs> I don't think they realized that they, they ultimately came to the conclusion that I had suggested in the first place. Anyway, because um, it's hard to be the one who stands out. It really is. And I didn't say anything else during that conversation because I was like, okay, well, that was the one thing I was going to say. <laughs> I'm not saying you all looked at me and I'm not going to say any, anything else. And that's how, what happens in groups. To avoid group think, group leaders could... Um, warn the people who are going to be in the meeting what the topic of conversation is going to be and then ask them to come prepared with their opinion about the, uh, the issue like written on a piece of paper have everybody put their pieces of paper into a bin and then the leader pulls them out writes the ideas up on the board without any kind of judgment or um, characterization or anything and then the group can discuss all these ideas nobody being tied to the idea the group leader not having expressed their idea. Theirs is just one of the strips that was in the bin. And that way, everybody's on equal footing and people are more willing to share their ideas. Okay, let's stop here and we'll come back in the next segment and talk about prejudice.